So welcome everyone to the second session. And um, what I'd like to do to get things started is just to recite the refuge verse today. So in your prayer book that I think most of you should have, if, if you don't have one, maybe you can share with someone next to you. Um, we're just gonna go to page eight. And there's a refuge in bodhicitta before the teaching. We'll do a short meditation on bodhicitta after we recite this. Uh, we're gonna do this once in English and then twice in the Tibetan chanting it. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Chodang Soki Chok Nam La Jang Chu Bardu Dakni Kyabsu Chi Daki Chunyan Gipe Sonam Gi Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shog Sangye Chodang Soki Chok Nam La Jang Chu Bardu Dakni Kyabsu Chi Daki Chunyan Gipe Sonam Gi Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shog Okay, let's do a short meditation then. Give ourselves a chance to focus the mind a bit and then develop a good motivation for being here. So we'll just do a few minutes of quiet meditation on the breath. I'm sure most of you have some technique that you already use with the breath. And then after that, I'll uh, lead you in a short reflection to set this motivation of bodhicitta for today. So now let's set our motivation. And to do this, I think it would be useful to review a little bit of what we did last night. I will do some more review in a few minutes, but there are those two aspects of Buddha nature. You know, one is the conventional mind that has the nature of clear light, meaning that at its most fundamental level, our minds are pure and free of any natural stains. All the stains that we have in our minds are adventitious. 
all the delusions we experience, the ignorance that is the root of those, all of those can be removed because they are not in the nature of our minds. And that is because we can realize the second aspect of lineage, the naturally abiding lineage or Buddha nature, the fact that our minds have been and always will be empty of inherent existence. They don't have at all that stain of being inherently existent. And by knowing that emptiness of that, we can come to the state of complete enlightenment. So it's interesting, later today we will be looking at one of the presentations that speaks to the function of Buddha nature. And its function is to help us to recognize that we can have a way out of samsara and a way to attain true peace, nirvana. And that's because when we hear that the mind is empty of inherent existence, when we hear that there is a way out through realizing that, then that gives us great joy that we can actually move in that direction. So studying this topic is one to bring us great joy, to help us to realize that our fundamental nature is pure and that we have the potential to remove all the stains and in that way fully accomplish what Buddha nature is there to help us to do, to attain the state of Buddhahood. So when we generate the mind of bodhicitta, we want to bring that same joy, that same recognition, that through encountering these teachings, and especially the wisdom of emptiness that supports these teachings, we have everything that we need then to achieve that goal. We simply need to unite it with this compassionate motivation that wishes to do that task for the benefit of all sentient beings. It recognizes that every single being is just like ourselves in that most fundamental way, continuing to be plagued by these delusions, these stains, but having that fundamental purity and the ability eventually to be rid of all of that, to attain enlightenment themselves. So formulate in your own mind that uh, powerful thought to bodhicitta, that wish to benefit all sentient beings, to help them to come to know their true nature, to help them to accomplish the work of removing all the adventitious stains, becoming fully enlightened, but then the recognition that in order to accomplish that, we have to work on ourselves. We have to learn more, we have to engage in these teachings so that we can be better qualified by becoming a Buddha ourselves. In that state, we will have the perfect power, the perfect compassion and perfect wisdom to be able to facilitate the enlightenment of all beings, just as our own enlightenment is being facilitated by the Buddhas that exist right now. So hold that thought throughout this morning, as well as the rest of today in the third session, as well as the rest of this life and holding that thought all the way into enlightenment. When you achieve that goal, and then we'll have the ability to fully enact the welfare of others. Okay. So I thought we would uh, review a few of the things that we went through last night. I, I didn't Sometimes when I do a course like this, I'll have time to like take some of the slides I want to show and put them at the beginning of some of the next part of our class. But I'm just going to go through what we went through last night, but in a rather more rapid way. We talked a little bit about the basic program. I'm not going to go through that. Um, again, this text that we're studying uh, is essentially this uh, sublime continuum composed by the Buddha Maitreya. And uh, there is a translation of this. Again, if you need to have any of the texts uh, the, the root verses, as well as uh, the charts that I'm using and referring to occasionally, as well as I have taken these slides and put them into a PDF file with four slides on a page so you can actually refer to them. Um, anyway, so again, this text is essentially um, 
an important one in this tradition to make sure that we have this cognition or this recognition of the Buddha nature that each of us possess. As I was saying in the motivation that within that we can generate great joy that we have that potential to be able to become fully enlightened by realizing emptiness and so on. So last night I did an introduction to the text, the subject of Buddha nature. There are seven topics within this text that uh, the fourth one in this chart is called the basic constituent, but it's essentially Buddha nature. Uh, again, you have the first three are the three jewels, uh, which in this context, in one presentation, me is meant to be kind of the resultant state that we want to attain. We want to become the three jewels for others. We want to become a, a fully enlightened Buddha to be able to manifest the Dharma perfectly to others and to support the development of the Sangha and to even be that sort of Sangha for others, community of practitioners who helps them on the path. And then that's based on the most substantial cause, which is our Buddha nature. Buddha nature is what allows us to be able to become a Buddha ourselves. And we depend upon others who are enlightened, those who have attained enlightenment, the qualities that they possess, the sixth topic, and then the activities that they engage in. So none of us become enlightened on our own in some sort of solitary world. We need the Buddhas as a support in order to accomplish that. So it's kind of a circular thing. We have our Buddha nature, so we can become the Buddha, but we have to be <laughs> guided on the path by others who are already Buddhas. And then once we become a Buddha, then we help others in the same way. It's kind of a, a process that will keep going until samsara is completely emptied of all beings, and all beings have attained enlightenment. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit here, past those seven topics, and talk a, again a little bit about Buddha nature. Uh, if we wanted to define Buddha nature in general, we would say it's that which has the ability to transform into a body of a Buddha. And body, as I mentioned last night, doesn't mean a physical body necessarily. It means some component of the experience of enlightened ex existence, if you will. Uh, so it can be something that is not physical, such as the mind of a Buddha. We will see terms throughout this that might they are completely interchangeable with Buddha nature. Uh, Tathagata essence, Buddha potential, Buddha lineage, basic constituent we saw earlier. These are all referring to the same phenomenon. When we talk about the bodies of a Buddha, we do use this term body in uh, Sanskrit kaya, and we can divide them into two main ones, the truth body and the form body, the dharmakaya and rupakaya. And <coughs> dharmakaya is a term you will hear quite frequently in, in this exposition of this text. Uh, the dharmakaya itself in a general way, we can say, is the enlightened mind of a Buddha. That's more technically the second one that is on the list here, the wisdom truth body. It's the wisdom mind of a Buddha that has completely removed all the obscurations, all the stains, and is manifesting in that completely pure way. It was already free of any kind of natural stains, but is now free of all the adventitious stains. Uh, its freedom from the adventitious stains is talked about in terms of the first element. The nature body is referring to the emptiness of a Buddha's mind, that the Buddha, Buddha's mind, like all phenomena, doesn't have any inherent existence. Again, these are the terminology, the terminology that's used frequently to speak about emptiness, but there are many ways of talking about hypothetical synonyms for this word inherent existence. It doesn't exist, so these are all hypothetical, but you have inherent existence, substantial existence, intrinsic existence, existence from its own side, existence by way of its own character, uh, objective existence, all these things, natural existence. It refers to something having its own mode of existence from its own side, out there on its own. Now again, when we're talking about the mind, it's not out there on its own, but it's in here on its own, kind of able to stand on its own without depending upon any other factors, In most specifically without depending upon mere designation, imputation. In the end, Buddha says everything exists simply by us designating it as such, and not simply through language, but conceptually classifying things as what we conceive them as. And this is all that exists in terms of there is a basis, in this case the mind of a Buddha, that is seen through the lens of its lack of inherent existence, that it doesn't exist on its own and is merely labeled, therefore, merely labeled as the wisdom truth body. Even emptiness itself, the nature body, which is the emptiness of a Buddha's mind, is merely labeled on a basis of the negation of inherent existence of the Buddha's mind. Everything, again, I won't go, won't go into extensive teachings on emptiness because the weekend isn't really about emptiness, but emptiness revolves around this because we are obviously talking about that component 
of uh, the mind, its emptiness, which is what allows for the entire process and which is a constant throughout the entire existence of our minds, which go back without any beginning and go forward without any end. But eventually when we have reached that thresh, crossed that threshold and become a Buddha, we simply talk about the emptiness of the mind differently. Prior to enlightenment, it's called the naturally abiding Buddha nature or lineage. After enlightenment, it's called the nature body because at that point we have a different basis because although the mind is the same in terms of it just being mind and our continuum of mind, it is now transformed. It's completely purified. When it comes to that uh, wisdom truth body though, that wisdom truth body, as I said last night, is not accessible to ordinary beings. It needs form in which to be with others, to talk to others, teach others, and so on. So there are two main forms in which the Buddhas appear. Uh, in terms of categories, but within the second one, the emanation body, there are a variety of ways, infinite ways, that the Buddhas can emanate. Uh, the Buddhas can emanate as an you know, inanimate object. They can emanate as a dog. They can emanate as a, a human being. They can emanate as a guru. They can emanate as a, a god in the god realm. They can <laughs> emanate in whatever way is beneficial. The complete enjoyment body, on the other hand, is a bit more static. It's a, uh, a, an, a form of the Buddha that appears in their own pure land and that only bodhisattvas who have realized emptiness can have access to. And so it's a higher realm of teaching and instruction that exists to support bodhisattvas on their path uh, to complete their path to enlightenment. But all of us need Buddhas and their influences in our lives. So the emanation body makes up for that and makes sure that we all have some way of accessing the Buddha exactly according to our karma. So the Buddhas won't appear identical to every single being, but they will appear as best as they can based on the karma of that being. There's nothing stopping the Buddhas from appearing from their side. It's up to the sentient beings to have removed the obstacles to be able to experience Buddhas in their purer forms. Again, this whole set of teachings I'm doing is part of the celebration of 600 years since Lama Tsongkhapa passed away, who was the founder of the Glukpa tradition. It's said that he was able to access his gurus and the Buddhas in the form of Manjushri, this Buddha of wisdom who is right here in the gold tanka that's uh, right to the side there, holding this sword of wisdom. So this is what appeared to him in order to teach the Dharma to him and guide him on his path to achieving enlightenment. You know, it's up to our own individual karma in terms of how the Buddhas appear. So, when we divide Buddha lineage or Buddha nature, we can see that there are two aspects to it then. There's the naturally abiding lineage, which is the reality, the emptiness, the suchness of a mind that's together with defilements. So we have this mind right now, if we were still in samsara and still you know, unenlightened, we have this mind that is together with defilements, that's been with defilements since beginningless time. It's contaminated with these obscurations and we usually call those then sentient beings that have those minds. Sentient being versus Buddha, it doesn't mean that a Buddha isn't a being. It just means that uh, sentient being is always referring to those beings that are contaminated with some level of the obscurations. So it is that which is suitable to be transformed into an uncompounded body, meaning uh, a body that is not created through causes and conditions of a Buddha, which is essentially the nature truth body. That's the only one on that list these list of four that is an, an, uh, an emptiness. It's an emptiness of the Buddha's mind. We can say, yes, the form bodies are empty as well, but we're not going to talk about their emptiness. It's most important to understand the emptiness of a Buddha's mind, that that, that is a, kind of the emptiness of our own minds. That is the naturally abiding lineage. It's just our minds, the basis, are together with contaminations, whereas the Buddha's mind, when you cross that threshold, is free of all of that and therefore becomes the nature truth body. On the other hand, we have the developmental lineage, and that refers to the potentiality that exists in the mind of a sentient being that, by way of the imprints, left on the mind through the force of these three wisdoms, the wisdom of hearing, reflecting, concentrating, uh, meditating, they can be progressively developed. This potential can you know, be developed completely into the final attainment of Buddhahood. And it becomes uh, the compounded bodies, the produced bodies of a Buddha, which are essentially the other three. The wisdom truth body is our, our, the mind that eventually becomes the enlightened mind of a Buddha. It also is a conditioned phenomenon. It's arising through the force of its prior causes and conditions. The form bodies are obviously you know, a conditioned phenomenon because anything in our material world that is form, which includes objects of sight, sound, smell, and so on, all of those are compounded phenomena. 
And so anything that's going to appear to us, although it's through the force of a Buddha's mind, is going to be, you know, in the nature of form and therefore be a compounded phenomenon. So the developmental lineage can manifest into the form bodies, which are the main way that Buddhas are able to help others, but it also, of course, is the wisdom truth body. I do have to touch on this again, just to make sure everyone's on board and knows what we're talking about here. Again, we can nominally speak of two types of stains or contaminations then, if we talk about our minds that are together with contaminations. The natural stains, which actually don't contaminate the mind, but we are adhering to that as if it were there. This is, again, uh, this uh, idea of inherent existence, the idea that our minds and all phenomena exist from their own side. This is the ignorance that the Buddha says is at the root of all of our suffering. And so those natural stains don't exist. What we are believing in doesn't exist at all. So we can say that from the very beginning, our mind has been free of any of those stains. That's our naturally abiding lineage, right? The fact that there is an emptiness of the mind that has always been there. The mind has never been inherently existent. No phenomena have ever been inherently existent. So this is just to get that very clear that although we think that exists, it doesn't exist at all. Whereas the adventitious stains, which actually do contaminate the mind of a sentient being, these are all the ignorance and delusions and so on that we've created and even the imprints of those uh, that have caused us to continue to be unenlightened. And although they have obscured the natural purity of the mind since beginningless time, they can be removed. And last night I talked a bit about the process of removal, which I won't go into today, but essentially it means combating the ignorance with wisdom because these two are diametrically opposed. And if we develop wisdom to a really great degree, which is through the force of our meditative concentration, we can actually, and in conjunction with accumulating you know, that merit that arises through our compassionate action, our virtue, and so on, if we are able to do all of that, we can attain complete enlightenment through having removed those all entirely. The next uh, slide again just then speaks to the fact that we do have things that we can say we're negating on the path or negating through our practice. The object of negation that do not exist which refers to those natural stains, again, that I just said don't have any existence at all. Nothing inherently exists. So all of this idea that we think that our minds or that other phenomena or that ourselves are inherently existent, none of that exists whatsoever. And that can be negated as existent by logic and reasoning, you know, through actually doing the work that the Buddha set out uh, for us to do. There are many reasonings. The uh, weekend that I did last weekend at Vajrapani, we went through a number of these reasonings. There are some that are more uh, used than others. Uh, the reasoning of dependent arising is one of the most powerful to do that, which is to come to the realization that you cannot have this kind of independent, objective, substantial existence if everything that exists is dependent upon other factors. And as I said just a few minutes ago, dependent in particular upon mere designation, mere imputation. And so anyway, that's one reasoning that will help you to negate those natural stains. But the object of, objects of negation that do exist are the adventitious stains, because those are in our minds. If they weren't in our minds, if they didn't exist, then we would already be enlightened. So these are the conception of inherent existence, as well as the other obscurations that arise from that. And they're negated primarily by the mind, the path consciousness that realizes emptiness, that recognizes that the natural stains don't exist. So these two work, again, in tandem in terms of we have to recognize the object of uh, negation that doesn't exist. Negating that, we realize emptiness and therefore remove the adventitious stains, the ignorance that believed in all of that. So we don't need to cover this, I don't think. Um, let's go forward to the 10 presentations. I think that's fine. The 10 presentations, and in this, the rest of today, we're going to be going through the remainder of the 10 presentations. We only got to the first one last night, and I'll review that one briefly. The 10 presentations do serve a particular purpose, as we saw, and I'll review in just a moment. Then there are what are called the nine similes. And as I mentioned, I, I think it's more important to make sure I cover the 10 presentations rather than the nine similes. The nine similes are somewhat easier in some regard, but they're, they're also easier to study uh, on your own. So um, if you do have the chance to do that, there are teachings out there that go into each of these. Um, the 10 presentations, the first thing that we're going to look at is the topic that Maitreya set out to establish the clear light nature of the mind, that the mind is fundamentally pure and clear, 
with the implication then that everything is adventitious, that's polluting it, and therefore can be removed. But nonetheless, the nine similes give these wonderful kind of examples that establish the defilements as being adventitious, that there's nothing in the nature of that uh, clear light mind that is in line with that, that it's all there just because we haven't created the causes for it to be removed. Remember last night I used the idea of a glass of water, which I use frequently whenever I talk about emptera, <laughs> the clear light nature of the mind. So a glass of water is clear, right? We can see right through it. That's its, that's its nature. But if I go out and get some dirt and pour it into the water and mix it all up, it becomes opaque and you know, we can't, there's no clarity. But is the clarity really gone? The clarity is just not manifest because the dirt is obscuring that. So if I run this through, you know, a really fine filter and all of that dirt is removed, this is why we have clean, clear water in this country because people are doing this, right, for us. How amazing, how kind. Um, so we have then this, the clarity of the water returning. But it was never really gone in a sense. It was always there as the fundamental kind of substratum in which all of the pollutants were kind of residing and abiding. All of that, though, can be removed, as we saw, because we can realize the emptiness of the mind, the emptiness of all phenomena, because all of what pollutes our mind is built on that ignorance that thinks that things exist truly, inherently, independently. So these two things kind of each serve a slightly different purpose and a different way of approaching Buddha nature, but they're all equally instructive. But there are many elements to the 10 presentations. Um, we won't go through the verse for that, but we essentially saw in introducing this that among the 10 presentations, the first six are individual topics that are meant to be fully explored, and we will do all of those, and hopefully the other four as well. We'll see how the day is going. But the first one is nature, ngowo, which is this Tibetan term which refers to kind of what is its nature in, in the deepest sense, in terms of emptiness, but we can also see as part of this presentation its conventional nature in terms of the mind um, and Buddha nature. The cause, uh, we'll get into that later today, these are the causes that help us to uh, have the Buddha nature uh, be made manifest and for us to be able to achieve the result of enlightenment on the basis of that, the results that we gain from those causes, the function that Buddha nature plays, I touched on this briefly in the meditation I just led, that Buddha nature does serve the function of helping us to develop that aversion towards samsara and the ability to move away from it versus, you know, and then moving towards nirvana, towards liberation and enlightenment. Possession, meaning kind of what is possessed by that Buddha nature, and then the categories of manifestations, meaning how Buddha nature can be posited as different depending upon the mind of a being who is developing their their qualities on the way to enlightenment, the different ways in which the Tathagata essence or Buddha nature manifests. That sixth division, manifestation, can be seen as further elaborated or divided into these four that will hopefully go into the states, the different states in which the Tathagata essence is found, pervasion, the way in which the Tathagata essence pervades all, all beings. Its immutability can never be changed. Its indivisibility, the way in which it is indivisible. So each of those topics, are, they're fairly brief. There are longer discussions of them in the full study of this text, but nonetheless, I think we can hopefully cover those. Last night, we went into the first presentation on nature. So the presentation of nature, this is also on the chart that you have uh, in that first page of chart one. Um, I think it's in column E, the fifth column over to the right. It says, the presentation of nature shows that the defilements are not the nature of the mind. They are just adventitious and can therefore be removed from the mind. The stains can be removed because they don't exist by their own nature. They, they don't have any inherent existence. That things that lack inherent existence can be changed, can be altered. Their mode of apprehension is not in accord with reality. They are not grounded in truth. They're not grounded in logic, in valid cognition. They're grounded in ignorance. And the nature of the Dharmakaya, suchness, and lineage are completely pure. I didn't mention this last night, but sometimes this is referred to in some commentaries as the threefold nature. When we talk about Buddha nature and kind of what it is essentially, it's the Dharmakaya, which is, of course, primarily the nature uh, truth body of the Buddha that has fully developed uh, along, or that has continued as emptiness, but is with the mind that is fully developed. 
the suchness of the mind, which is the emptiness that has always been there, that is the same after enlightenment as it is before enlightenment, and then the lineage itself, which here would refer to the na nature, I'm sorry, naturally abiding lineage, which would be the emptiness of the mind that we have currently that allows that whole process to occur. Also, the developmental lineage is there with that because obviously we have to have both. We have the mind that's the basis, which can be developed into enlightenment, and the naturally abiding lineage, which is its emptiness. So we went through these. Let's read this little verse. Like the natural purity of a jewel, space, and water, the nature of the basic constituent is always unafflicted. So there's three analogies, and as I mentioned last night, this is one of the beautiful things about this text is that Maitreya uses analogies all the time to kind of give a way of expounding upon certain topics. And so essentially, these three things we're talking about, the Dharmakaya, suchness, and lineage, are by nature ever pure or undefiled. They, they are never afflicted. You know, they, again, when we talk about the naturally abiding lineage, obviously the developmental lineage is currently afflicted and contaminated. Um, but nonetheless, it's clear light nature that's residing underneath it is unafflicted. You know? So there's ways of looking at things within this context depending upon how you're looking at it. Uh, Geshe Loden in his text says, these three are by nature ever pure or undefiled in that they have always had a nature of being an emptiness of inherent existence. And that's the case again if we talk about lineage as being the naturally abiding lineage. So let's look at how um, we can look at, uh, examine these three in terms of the three analogies that are used, that the dharmakaya is like a wish-fulfilling jewel, that the suchness of the stained mind is like space, meaning here kind of uncompounded space, the absence of, an, of uh, obstructive contact, and then the lineage, the developmental lineage or that is like water. And when we talk about the analogy of water, then we have to use a developmental lineage because of the nature of that. It's talking about the mind there, uh, not the emptiness of the mind. But once more, these t ter terms you'll sometimes see kind of both used in different contexts, naturally abiding lineage versus developmental lineage. So let's look at the verse that speaks to that, why these three are fundamentally pure and therefore you know, compared to a jewel, uh, space, and water. Because of having the power of fulfilling hopes, of not changing to anything other in nature, and of being a nature whose entity is moist with compassion, the basic constituent is qualitatively similar to the features of a precious wish-granting jewel, space, and water. So we looked at these last night, but we'll go through this briefly. The Dharmakaya of a Buddha is like a wish-fulfilling or wish-granting jewel. Again, this is this mythical jewel that allows sentient beings to use it to get whatever they want. Um, again, the actual wish-granting wish jewel that's spoken of in this kind of mythology only allows you to get material things, but obviously we're talking about a wish-granting jewel that allows you to have complete enlightenment because this is what the Dharmakaya of a Buddha does. It helps sentient beings to attain that by interacting with sentient beings' minds and therefore fulfilling all their hopes. Since this is the case, the Tathagata essence of sentient beings is a wish-fulfilling jewel too. Because due to it, sentient beings can attain the dharmakaya of a Buddha. It's like we do have what becomes the dharmakaya of a Buddha. We do have that within our own continuum right now. And that's, again, what is often, when we get to the nine similes, most of them have that idea that there's something kind of pure and precious and wonderful in the midst of being obscured by all of these things that uh, we have currently in our minds. But we have that potential. We have that exact potential the same as the Buddhas, we have an emptiness of the mind that is the same as the Buddhas. The suchness of the stained mind is like space because it does not change due to causes and conditions. This is the thing about uncompounded space when we talk about being, as it says there, the mere negation of obstructive contact. That in and of itself, it's a, neg a negation and therefore doesn't change moment to it by moment. You know, they oftentimes talk about composed space, which is like the space that is inside a vessel that is composed by the things that are around it. That would be a slightly different phenomenon. Here we're talking about a mere negation, which is not physical space. It is the idea that there's a negation of obstructive contact. Therefore, the microphone can be here, and I can be here, and the computer can be there, and so on. It's, it's referring to this phenomenon that is a negation, just like emptiness or suchness 
is a mere negation of true existence, inherent existence, and so on, all those synonyms. So that suchness of our stained mind doesn't you know, change, it's the same. Therefore, it can be in that continuum of getting us all the way to enlightenment, become the nature truth body. And because we can realize the emptiness of the mind and see that it is naturally free of any of those stains, again, and by virtue of that, remove the adventitious stains. Now, again, I, I did point this out earlier, but on this slide, this comes again from the chart that you have, that when we divide the lineage, we can say there are two, and they're both a bit implicit in here. As Geshe Loden was saying, he was talking about the naturally abiding lineage because he was saying all three of these uh, elements of the nature are, are emptinesses. The Dharmakaya, meaning the nature truth body of the Buddha, the suchness of our own minds, and the naturally abiding lineage are all emptinesses. And so, therefore, we have that kind of emptiness that is the the that nature of our minds but nonetheless there's a developmental component there's the mind that is by its nature clear and pure in its most fundamental state but is contaminated at the moment and has that contaminations all the way up through the end of our developmental lineage when we cross that threshold the developmental lineage is over and the mind that was of a sentient being becomes the mind of a buddha becomes the wisdom truth body of a buddha so just to read the words that are on here, the natural abiding lineage is the suchness of the stained mind, which is its supporting phenomenon that is suitable to transform into the nature body of a Buddha. The Buddha lineage, that is the developmental lineage, is suitable to transform into the compounded body of a Buddha, which occurs when one crosses that threshold, removes all the obscurations in the mind. The latter one of these, the one that is developmental, is like water. Why? Because it is moist with compassion for sentient beings. Now we can say the emptiness of the mind is also together with that compassion, but it's a quality more of the mind, the developmental mind, than it is of the naturally abiding lineage. So any comments on that before we go into new material? I didn't mean to spend quite so much time reviewing, but I think it was important, you know, <laughs> just to pound those seeds in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, no questions. Okay, let's let's move on then. Again, if you, if you do have the chart in front of you, it might be useful, but it, it, the chart make, might get more confusing simply because there's a lot more in the chart than I'm covering. But after the course, perhaps you can go back and look at the chart and see if it solidifies some of your knowledge, recognizing that there, especially column four, has all this peripheral information that I'm usually not even going to touch on. Sometimes even column three has some stuff that I may not talk about. Um, so let's go into the second presentation. Uh, I'm going to read what Geshe Loden says. Well, actually, let me, go, let me go ahead and read what's on our chart first. This is, again, in the last column of that chart one for the second of the presentation's cause. It says, The presentation of cause demonstrates the fact that the mind is by nature pure and that the stains are adventitious by the fact that there are four causes that are capable of separating the mind from those stains. There are four things that if we rely upon, we can actually overcome the obstacles to those, which are on your chart, and I am going to talk about those. They're not on a screen, unfortunately. I just didn't put them in there. I'm not sure why when I put this presentation together some years ago, but nonetheless, we can talk about them in relation to the four causes. These are the causes we have to rely upon in order to achieve, achieve the result, in order to utilize what we have as Buddha nature to manifest it fully into the state of enlightenment. So, um, in this case, Geshe Loden says, causes refers to the four particular causes which purify the obscurations to realizing the threefold nature. We just talked about, again, of dharmakaya, suchness, and lineage. The, these causes enable the threefold nature to emerge by purifying the obstructions to it. So if you go to the chart, well, let's go to, through the four causes first, and then we'll go to the, to the opposite of these. Let's read this together. It arises from devotion to the great vehicle doctrine, the higher wisdom realizing selflessness, the immeasurable meditative stabilization endowed with bliss, and compassion for sentient beings. So these are the four, and on your chart, you know, they are listed in that um, second column in terms of faith. It's called there, if you have faith in the Mahayana Dharma, that's like uh, a seed of an emperor, a Buddha. 
And then we have the wisdom that is realizing emptiness that is said to be like a mother. And then we have samadhi that is like the womb of the mother. And then we have great compassion that is like a nurse, uh, maybe like a midwife or something that is aiding in the process of that birth um, being able to be made. So they use this analogy here of someone who is a woman who is giving birth. We often call the perfection of wisdom the mother of all the Buddhas because it is through the force of the wisdom realizing emptiness that all of the Buddhas are created and that all beings who realize emptiness and go on whatever path they're on, whether they're on the Hinayana paths or the Mahayana path, they're able to achieve their results through the perfection of wisdom. So therefore they are born from the mother. The opposites to each of these, and I think maybe I can go through now. Let me just look at uh, where we're going on the chart to make sure I'm not jumping ahead too much. Um, actually, let's go ahead and read the next verse before I look at those opposites. Because the next verse talks about those four uh, analogies for each of these. Those who have the seed, which is devotion to the supreme vehicle, the mother, which is the wisdom giving birth to the Buddha qualities, the womb, which is the bliss of concentration, and the nurse, which is compassion, are the bodhisattva children born from the mind of the subduer. So again, if you have all of these, then you're a bodhisattva. You know, those who are on the Hinayana path wouldn't obviously have the great compassion that is and as well as the devotion to the supreme vehicle, as probably even, you know, the third one, the, the wisdom, I'm sorry, the, the bliss of concentration that is achieved in the, the bodhisattva path. But nonetheless, they would have the wisdom that gives birth to uh, the qualities of nirvana. But again, that's just pointing out a sub-point. The main, this is a Mahayana text, so we're mostly looking at it from the point of view of those of us who are aspiring to the bodhisattva path, uh, getting the instruction there. So again, these are what I just said. I don't need to review this perhaps, but again, like a seed. Faith is like a seed. Wisdom like the mother. Samadhi, or this deep meditative stabilization, is like the womb. And then great compassion like a nurse. Whoops. Yeah, that was the end of the presentation there. So I've got to talk a little bit more about what these mean then. If you have your chart in front of you, if you do have that on a screen or something that you can pull up, um, it's the second page of the that set of charts, it was a bit longer, I don't know, it was about 20 pages or so, maybe not quite that many. Um, chart one is the 10 presentations. And so in the third column, it says the four obstacles that are purified by the four causes are hatred towards the Mahayana, or we could say a disdain of the Mahayana, or even just a, uh, I don't think it has to be huge. Yeah, any, any, any type of, you know, because again, those on the Hinayana path, may hear the Mahayana teachings. Actually, they say hearers. There are hearers and solitary realizers. These are the two practitioners that they say practice the Hinayana vehicle, which is the individual vehicle. It's taught by the Buddha as a completely valid path for those who only have the ability to bear the burden of their own individual liberation. And so the hearers, they say, actually do hear the Mahayana Dharma, but they simply don't aspire to it. You know, they say, oh, that's nice. I'm, I'm glad that bodhisattvas can practice that, but that's not what I practice. <laughs> you know, so it's even just some neglect of the Mahayana, perhaps. But that is overcome, obviously, by faith in the Mahayana Dharma. And those of us who, again, are aspiring for the Mahayana path to be able to uh, become bodhisattvas and become Buddhas eventually, this is what we need to cultivate because it will overcome any of the tendency that we have to move in some other direction, whether it be in a Hinayana direction or whether it be some other direction that kind of totally moves away from this precious path. The wisdom realizing emptiness counteracts the views of the self, meaning that these false conceptions that we have of the self that need to be overcome. And obviously, again, that's called the mother in this analogy because that is where all of it arises from. That is the most central thing that it accomplishes the task of removing all these adventitious stains. Whereas faith in the Mahayana is like the seed from the father, which does allow that to all grow and develop within the mother, but it's the mother that gives birth, not the father. The samadhi, that is this deep meditative concentration, overcomes fear of cyclic existence. This is kind of an interesting one. Essentially, you know, they say that uh, the bodhisattvas want to, want to be free of two fears, which is a fear of cyclic existence and a fear of uh, samsara, you know, so, or I'm sorry, of nirvana. 
because those two things can be feared to some degree because the bodhisattva doesn't want to develop, they want to develop the necessary aversion to samsara, to get renunciation, but they don't want to develop the aversion that drives them then to want their individual liberation. <laughs> because if, they, if that fear of psychic existence falls into the Hinayana vehicle, well then they'll exit stage left, you know, and that's the end of the, the show. They won't continue on their path. So psychic exist, this fear of psychic existence is something they have to overcome. And they want to be able to say, I'm going to continue to be in psychic existence, like that wonderful prayer that His Holiness loves so much at the end of Master Shanti Deva's text, you know, for as long as space exists, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the miseries of the world. It's like that really strong conviction to say, I don't care if samsara is a prison in a boiling pit of fire or whatever, I'm going to stay in this because I want to help sentient beings. On the other hand, bodhisattvas also generate by virtue of that, you know, the fear of nirvana, that they don't want to exit out into that, you know, state of nirvana and, you know, have an end to their own suffering, but nonetheless leave all those other sentient beings who are suffering, all those kind mother sentient beings behind. So here it's mostly counteracting the fear of psychic existence. How? Because you can attain through the state of samadhi, through deep meditative stabilization, this bliss that kind of gives you an ability to be with whatever's going on and not have the mind be so agitated or bothered by the sufferings of samsara. You know, when you de develop these deep concentrations, which I haven't done, but they say that, you know, you are able to have these really quite profound states of well-being. You know, Venerable René, who some of you were talking about earlier, he, he talks about how even getting to the fourth mental abiding that leads you to calm abiding, there are nine of these stages that get you there. Even getting to the fourth, you're experiencing a state of well-being you've never had before in this life. This is what he says. I think he's probably experienced it. So nonetheless, you know, if you want to know that, you have, go experience it yourself, you know, put the energy into doing that. You know, I should be telling myself that too. <laughs> but this is like the womb. This is like that safe place in which we can develop then because when we are in the world and still continuing to be in psychic existence, we can be with it in a much more tranquil way. It's not like right now, all of us being completely bothered by all the things that are going on in our lives and having to deal with all the uh, suffering of samsara and so on. So the fear of psychic existence would be the exact opposite of having this kind of blissful state of samadhi. The last thing that we overcome through great compassion, which is like this nurse that helps the process along to make sure that birth actually occurs, is having no concern for sentient beings, you know, being separated from concern for sentient beings, whereas great compassion is the ideal concern for others, which is not just kind of having this thought, oh, you know, all those poor sentient beings suffering, I hope it works out for them. I, how wonderful if they could be free from all that. I mean, that's from a distance, observing them and having those thoughts. This is like the roll up your sleeves and saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get them out of that state. I'm going to take full responsibility. Great compassion is that type of mind. So the exact opposite of it would be somebody who has no concern for sentient beings, who is really, you know, and again, I think it's hard to find somebody who has no concern for any sentient beings, but we're talking here about all sentient beings in this context. So if you don't have that concern for all sentient beings, then you're lacking this necessary component. This is why developing great compassion on the path is so important. So again, on your chart, you do have in column D, the fourth column, all these things that go on about various people and various positions in terms of these two extremes of nirvana and samsara and da-da-da-da. I'm not going to go into all of that because in the full course we would if we were doing it for the basic program. But So any questions on these causes? Yes, Kim. I think you mentioned this, but I just want to confirm. Okay. So the four remedies in column two, they are direct antidotes to the four defilements in column, column three. three. Yes. So samadhi is the direct antidote to fear. To the fear of general. cyclic existence, existence, yeah. Let me, I might even read a little bit from, well, actually this is, this is for the next one, the result, which actually ties into this as well, because we can see the results are lining up with the four causes. So we have kind of the obstacles that we start with that we might be to some degree dealing with that we don't have those fully, 
uh, or I mean that we haven't cultivated the four causes fully. We may not have them in the full-fledged form of hatred towards the Mahayana, but maybe we ha even have our own hesitations around the Mahayana even, and so on. That's where we are, or some beings are now. We've started to move in the direction of these four causes. Those four causes have to be fully completed to give forth four results. So we're going to see that in the next presentation, and I'll talk a little bit more. Geshe Tenzin Temple shares a nice little way of kind of how that all lines up, you know, how those three sets of four. Let's move on then if there are no other questions. Okay. The third presentation is result. Again, by result, we mean the results that will arise on the basis of the four causes that we just talked about. Presentation of result. This is also on your chart on the third page where we have the uh, presentation of result uh, in the fifth column there, column E. Presentation of result shows that the result of purifying the lineage of the four obstructions leads to the resultant four perfect purities of a Buddha. These, we haven't talked about these yet in terms of the presentation of the bodies of a Buddha. These aren't the four bodies of the Buddha that we talked about. These are four perfect purities of a Buddha. The fact that the mind is by nature pure and that the stains are adventitious is shown by way of indicating that perfect purity is attainable through causes that purify the mind or lineage of stain. So what we just looked at, again, were the four causes that help us to do that purification, help us to remove all those adventitious stains so that we can achieve the four purities of a Buddha. So let's read the verse that goes with that. The perfection of the qualities of purity, self, bliss, and permanence of the truth body, which is the fruit of purifying the obstructions through their antidotes, is the fruit. So as I mentioned last night, we get a lot of parenthetical information here through the kindness of Jeffrey Hopkins uh, and Joe Wilson, who did the translation. The root text itself would just simply have what's not in the parentheses, so the parentheses already gives us a good idea of what we're talking about here, but let's look at these four qualities that are spelled out in this verse. The perfections of the Dharmakaya, again the Dharmakaya being the, the enlightened mind of a Buddha as well as its emptiness, that is the entirety of the truth body, the nature truth body, and the wisdom truth body, that are the result of purification by way of the four causes, are the perfection of purity, the perfection of highest self, the perfection of highest bliss, and the perfection of permanence. All right, so we need an explanation of these, again, to go into them. So let's go through this a little bit more in regard to the next verse that follows. In brief, the fruits of these four causes, devotion to the great vehicle and so forth, are attainments of the four qualities distinguished as purity and so forth, that is, self, bliss, and permanence, through being antidotes that are opposite to the four erroneous aspects, impurity, and so forth, with respect to the truth body. So we're seeing again that they line up in terms of, um, of uh, those four antidotes uh, to the four obscurations, then give rise to the four purities. What we were calling the four causes are the antidotes. And there's... One more slide that kind of talks about this, and then I'm going to share with you what Gen Geshe Tenzin Temple says, because it gives a kind of a good explanation of it that I could try to articulate, but I'll rely upon those with more knowledge than myself. So from faith in the Mahayana Dharma, that was the first of the four causes that we just looked at in the second presentation, you gain the perfection of purity. From the wisdom realizing selflessness, you gain the perfection of highest self. From meditative stabilization, you get the perfection of highest bliss, and from great compassion, the perfection of permanence. So what do we mean by these? How are we talking about these? All right, so how is the devotion to the Mahayana the cause of purity? This is the first one, faith in the Mahayana. He says, the four causes were explained in terms of their opposites. The opposite to devotion and to the Mahayana is hatred for the Mahayana. That is, a strong attachment to mundane things, a strong attachment to just being blind to any potential goal that goes beyond that and just continuing to be involved in samsara. Uh, due to devotion to the Mahayana, we gradually reduce our attachment to mundane things and thereby gradually attain purity. If we devote ourselves to the Mahayana Dharma, that is, if we bring the Mahayana path to its culmination, and thereby attain the afflictive obscurations, I'm sorry, abandon the afflictive obscurations and obscurations to knowledge. 
we will become an enlightened being endowed with the two purities. So when we talk about purity, this is what we mean, is the purity of natural defilements, which once again has always been there, because we, we even have the purity of natural defilements, because there are no natural defilements, there are no natural stains. But then you also have, you are completely endowed with the purity of adventitious defilements. This is the difference between us and the Buddhas, is that we don't have the purity of the adventitious defilements yet, whereas the Buddhas are completely free of that. They've done the work to be able to remove that. So the truth body is called the truth body together with the two purities. That purity, a result, comes from the cause of devotion to the Mahayana in the sense of culminating the practice of the path. This is what is called the perfection of purity. So purity here has the sense of being cleansed. So it is through our faith in the Mahayana Dharma that we first have an antidote to those obst obstructions that keep us either bound in lower goals or keep us attached to psychic existence, all of that that keeps us from going on the Mahayana as we cultivate deeper and deeper faith. And by faith here, we don't necessarily mean a kind of blind faith or anything. Faith in Buddhism can sometimes be talked about in terms of three dimensions. Blind isn't any of these three. <laughs> the very first one, as I present them usually, is clear faith, which means it's the clarity that one gains as one continues to develop knowledge and to be able to understand very clearly what the objects of refuge are, for example, what the path to enlightenment is, what the four noble truths are, and so on. Then you have what's called aspiring faith, which is on the basis of that, you do aspire to achieve some of the results that are spoken of in those teachings. And then on the basis of your own investigation through continuing your experience and developing it, you gain what's called sometimes believing faith. I like using the term faith of conviction, you know, which is where through your own practice you've come to see that what you are aspiring for and the teachings you are using to do that, are get, it's getting you the results that you seek. So your faith is always grounded in some level of reason and experience. Sometimes they present them differently. I like presenting them that way. Sometimes they say you have to first have the clear faith, then the faith of conviction, and then you have the faith of aspiration that aspires for things on the basis of some conviction. But nonetheless, you know, however they're put together, we're talking here about faith of conviction. Faith of conviction is where you have an absolute certainty that this is it. This is the exit door <laughs> into enlightenment and into the best possible state that is the fulfillment of my potential and the ability to help others to do the same. So that's what we mean by this faith in the Mahayana. So it acts as a cause to attain the two purities. That is the perfection of purity. In the context of the perfection of the highest self, the second one, the highest self refers to selflessness, not to a type of self. So don't get this idea that we're talking about a self that is the Buddha self. We're talking about selflessness, which is emptiness. Mm -hmm. Thus it refers to the perfection of wisdom. Its cause is to meditate upon and eliminate the objects of negation, which can be the coarser objects of negation that we study in the tenet systems and so on, that, again, the highest tradition says you still have to refute some of those because we do have at least one of them innately. It is one of the stains that we carry over. But the deepest stain that we carry is the the ignorance that holds to inherent existence, that the higher school's uh, object of negation, a truly existent self. So we, again, if we looked at what the, um, on the previous uh, chart, what was the um, uh, obstacle, the obstacle is the views of a self, all these various views of a self, but especially this deep ignorance that is, uh, again, been there since beginning last time and has been the, the main cause, the root of all of our problems. We develop the wisdom that realizes selflessness and thereby attain the perfection of highest self, the perfection of this selflessness when we have realized fully the perfection of wisdom. You know, we use this term perfection, like the, we often talk about the six paramitas and say that they are the bodhisattva's practice, but the bodhisattva is really just practicing them. You don't have a fully qualified perfection of wisdom until you attain Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you haven't perfected your mind until then. You know, you can attain a surpassing practice of each of these that do indicate themselves in terms of certain abilities that you have. Like I was talking about um, the generosity that one engages in where eventually one can give away one's body. They say that when the bodhisattva enters the first ground, they have the perfection of generosity, the first of the perfections. And their ability is such that they will give up their body easily for anyone who needs it. They don't have any attachment to the body any longer. So if, you know, 
some wild beast wanted to devour my body and I was a first ground bodhisattva, I would happily give it to them. Or if little Tara the pug wanted to devour my body. I don't think so. <laughs> Poor little Tara. <laughs> <laughs> it takes so long to nibble you. Nibble me to death. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go on to the third. The third, again, was we had this fear of cyclic existence. And then we had the uh, samadhi, this blissful samadhi that the bodhisattvas can attain. And then we have here the, per- the perfection of highest bliss. So let's look at what uh, Geshe Tenzin Temple says on this. The perfection of highest bliss is the result of meditating on the perfection of concentration. That's the fifth of the paramitas. So is the perfection of concentration achieved merely by meditating on the various types of concentrations? Is the perfection of wisdom achieved merely by meditating on emptiness? No, they are not. This is because Hinayana practitioners also meditate on emptiness and meditate the various types of samadhi. And without a doubt, they have to have that in order to achieve their goal. They haven't practiced the perfection of wisdom and the perfection of concentration because that's together with the bodhisattva aspiration. So it says, you know, they do not attain the perfection of wisdom and the perfection of concentration. This is because the two that we just said are necessarily held by or conjoined with the side of method, that is, with great compassion. Thus, when the perfection of wisdom is conjoined with great compassion, it becomes the perfection. I think what he meant to say there is when the wisdom realizing emptiness is conjoined with great compassion, it becomes the perfection of wisdom. Likewise, when the practice of concentration is conjoined with great compassion, it becomes the perfection of concentration. Now, he said great compassion. Uh, you normally would say bodhicitta as well, but great compassion is the root of bodhicitta. It is the mind that the bodhisattva develops as a precursor to bodhicitta. Because bodhicitta isn't purely just great compassion. It is that great compassion that then motivates one to want to become a Buddha for the sake of others out of that sincere wish to remove the suffering of all beings. So he goes on to say then, the bliss of a Hinayana foe destroyer, again, a Hinayana being a hero or a solitary realizer that has practiced the path of the Hinayana to their individual liberation. They've attained what's called an arhat state or foe destroyer state. The bliss of that practitioner or a Hinayana Nirvana, is bliss, but it is not the highest bliss because there is a bliss or happiness that is higher than it. The bliss that is higher than that bliss is the bliss that is attained by way of meditating, a meditative stabilization on emptiness that is conjoined with great compassion, that is by way of combining method and wisdom. So it's just pointing out that the Bodhisattva has a meditative stabilization, a concentration that is a greater bliss because they are uniting it with that factor of great compassion, which is the fourth of the causes. But anyway, this is the third we're looking at is the ability to attain that bliss because the bodhisattva has a different state of mind that they are uniting that that concentration with. Go on to the fourth one. Fourth one again, the obstacle that we were overcoming was having no concern for sentient beings, you know, not being concerned about their suffering. And the Great compassion, of course, was the cause. It's on our screen. And from great compassion, we developed the perfection of permanence. So this is a a puzzle, right? How does permanence arise from this? And what do we mean by permanence in this context? The perfection of permanence is the result of meditation on great compassion. Hinayana hearers and solitary realizers have the the fear of the sufferings of samsara as their basic motivation. Because of this fear, they want to get out of samsara for their own sake. Then, for this reason, they work to free themselves from samsara. That is their mindset, right? You know, that's the mindset of someone on that Hinayana path. They see their own suffering and are absolutely convinced to get rid of it. They develop the mind of renunciation on the basis of that. Of course, bodhisattvas do as well, but only as a stepping stone to get to bodhicitta. That's their main mind. That's what causes them to enter their path, is the spontaneous mind of renunciation that is intent upon achieving one's own liberation having an end to one's own suffering, removing what are called the afflictive obscurations. The afflictive obscurations are the ignorance that is holding to inherent existence and everything that is built on that, as well as the seeds of that. The bodhisattvas are intent upon removing not just those, that's not even their main goal, they want to remove the knowledge obscurations, the obscurations to omniscience or Buddhahood, which are the imprints that arise from that ignorance that are in the mind that cause a false appearance to arise, thinking that things do, that appearing like things do exist on their own, 
on uh, self-established on their own. You know, so there are these, uh, as well as the inability then to kind of know the two truths, thinking that the two truths are somehow a completely different entity, when the two truths are kind of posited only within the scope of each other. There's they're a single entity in that way, not identical, but yet nonetheless part and parcel of the same phenomena. So remember we talked about last night, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. This is speaking to that. So we have obstacles to having a complete knowledge of the two truths in our minds simultaneously because of these deep imprints that we have that cause this false appearance, a dualistic appearance of things existing on their own outside uh, self-established and are uh, assenting to that of course is the ignorance but our uh, that appearing to us becomes an obstruction to our omniscience so let's see what he says here okay so we just talked about the Hinayana practitioners the opponent to this mindset is great compassion that's the cause that we saw the, the fourth and final cause great compassion destroys the selfish fear of samsara and instead strives to enact the welfare of others its final result is the perfection of permanence. So it's kind of saying again that, that for those on the Hinayana path, they lack the concern for other beings that they have for themselves. But obviously, many sentient beings have <laughs> things that even precede that. We're not only talking about those on the hearer or solitary realizer path. We're simply talking about the fact that even they, as noble as their goal is, lack the same concern for others that they have for themselves. They have their own fear of samsara that is very selfish in a way. His Holiness talks about this. I mean, this is a very subtle form of what we call in the Mahayana self-cherishing. But we tend to sometimes equate our self-cherishing as something that is kind of based in our self-grasping. But it doesn't have to be. A Hinayana practitioner can be free of all the self-grasping, but still have this subtle self-cherishing that His Holiness, in the book that was published a few years back with um, Venerable Tipton Children, Buddhism, uh, one teacher, many traditions. Uh, he goes into it, the best description I've seen about why this is so, because he says it isn't an affliction, this subtle self-cherishing that these beings have, because they're free of all the afflictions. It, it's an obstacle for the for the bodhisattvas because it's an obstacle to developing bodhicitta and having this great compassion and concern for others. But for the Hinayana practitioner, it's not something that is a afflicted state of mind, or they would abandon it. It's rather just a very subtle imprint that occurs in their minds that keeps them somewhat blind to that more universal concern. So anyway, that's an interesting little side note. You might look that up in uh, His Holiness's book. Its final result of this great compassion is the perfection of permanence. However, here, the word permanence does not refer to a phenomenon that does not have a cause, Rather, it refers to that which is eternal or never-ending. So it's the exact opposite of how we often talk about permanence. You know, in this tradition, we usually are saying, when, if I say permanent, I mean that which is not caused and which doesn't change moment by moment. Geshe Tempel, and I, there are differences in this, I'll point that out in a moment, but he's saying that it means that which is eternal or never-ending. That which is never-ending is the continuity or stream of enacting the welfare of others. I kind of like that idea, you know, that the enacting the welfare of others through the power of your great compassion is eternal. It goes on forever. You know, once you attain the state of Buddhahood, you don't like, you don't even need to take a vacation. <laughs> you, you don't, you're on vacation already. You know, you've never had vacation before this because you've always been <laughs> with the afflictions before this. So you're finally on vacation, but you're enacting the welfare of others spontaneously, effortlessly. Because you're like the sun that is shining. The sun doesn't go, oh my God, I've got to shine again today. It's just, that's, it's its nature. It shines. It like sends the rays out in all directions. The Buddhas are like that. They're just sending out their enlightening act, enlightened activities in all directions. So that sentient beings can be awakened. They can find their own true nature. They can discover the Buddha nature that is hidden within them and develop their minds to that degree. Just in the same way that, uh, that those Buddhas did. So I like that explanation. Nonetheless, I think in Geshe Loden's text, he talks about weak, how, and this is a more technical way of looking at permanence. You can say that the wisdom truth body of, or that the Dharmakaya is a permanent phenomenon. Why? Because one of the things within it, the nature truth body, is a permanent phenomenon. And this is just a more classic way of talking about things in terms of sets and what have you in Buddhism. I, I'm not going to go too far with that, but nonetheless. I like this other description better because it speaks to the eternal 
spinning of the wheel of dharma in whatever ways you know the manifesting and emanating for other beings in whatever ways all of that that just keeps happening for eternity until all sentient beings are in enlightenment themselves yes venerable carol i just wondered if you could um define the the knowledge obscurations just sure, at one again. more time. Yeah, yeah um, essentially they say that they are the imprints that are left on the mind through the force of the ignorance adhering to inherent existence that we've had since beginningless time. The analogy that's frequently used, I mean, that's the main way. We can talk about two other components of that that are knowledge obscurations as well. The false appearance that arises from those imprints, which again causes things to exist, like my hand to ex- seem to, it appears to exist, from this base, from out here. seems to have its own handness that kind of covers the whole thing. That is a false appearance. That is arising through the force of my imprints from my ignorance. The ignorance is what grasps to that as, as inherently existent, that thinks that hand is inherently existent because it appears that way. That's why unraveling ignorance is so difficult. It's because everything appears to exist on its own. Lama Zopa, when he teaches on it, he says, if you get really clear about what that false appearance is, you've identified the object of negation because how things appear as if they are self-established on their own, existing from their own side by way of their own characteristics. If you get that, then you get what it is that we are falsely adhering to. So that's another little clue perhaps from Rinpoche about how we need to go about examining this. So as I said, another thing that is identified often as part of that then is also then what we would call the obscurations to realizing the two truths simultaneously to kind of acknowledge that they are a single entity that we're simply acknowledging the ultimate nature of things and the conventional nature of things. Conventional nature being that they're merely imputed, a merely imputed hand on this base, versus the ultimate nature of it being the lack of an inherently existent hand. Those are the two truths that a Buddha knows simultaneously. Once they've crossed that threshold, they know that all phenomena, they know all conventional truth, they know all ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the knowledge obscurations, those Mm -hmm. are um, overcome by an enlightened mind only. I mean, when we're... You begin to remove them on the bodhisattva path at the path of meditation going into the pure grounds. Uh, When you come into the pure grounds, you've removed all the afflictive obscurations. On the eighth, ninth, and tenth grounds, you gradually remove those in three levels. Okay. And then after the tenth ground, you are Buddha. In those levels, it's it's sort of like when you're in um, uh, in, m- in meditative concentration, mm-hmm. then you you mm-hmm. they're gone. But then when you awake from that, or there's rise still a false there's still a yeah. false appearance, right? Exactly. Okay. I just wanted to so in the yeah in this state that we call meditative equipoise, which is the bo- the bodhisattva's direct realization of emptiness, and of course the term could also be used, I suppose, for Hinayana practitioners, but nonetheless, we're going to talk about bodhisattvas here. But a meditative equipoise is where one goes into meditative concentration on emptiness and it becomes a direct realization, meaning it's non conceptual. On the basis of that, some level of obscuration will generally be removed. Not that it always is, it depends upon the merit that is together with that, because you have to have a requisite amount of merit to be able to remove these obstacles as well. The bodhisattva goes through. The path of seeing and the path of meditation. The path of seeing is their initial seeing of emptiness if they are someone who was first entering the Mahayana. If they had entered the Hinayana and completed it and then they come into the Mahayana, then they've already realized emptiness. But nonetheless, for a bodhisattva who is determined in that lineage from the very beginning, they uh, enter into the path of what's called the path of accumulation, sometimes called the path of merit. They go on to the second path, which is the path of preparation, which prepares them to see, having accumulated enough wisdom and kind of virtuous activity to cross that threshold. And they do that by realizing emptiness with still a conceptual mind, but a very very powerful one with what's called the union of calm abiding and special insight. Then they, through four levels of the path of preparation, they make the mind more and more refined in terms of the view of emptiness to where there's a, a beginning of the falling away of a sense of subject and object. It becomes less and less defined till they get to the last of the four levels of the path of preparation. They go into a meditative equipoise and they see emptiness directly when subject and object as distinct entities completely fall apart and you have this feeling of like emptiness 
um, and the mind realizing it being merged like water poured into water. Again, I don't know this experience. I'm just saying it from the text that I've studied. Um, so that's the path of seeing. You've now entered the path of seeing, and you remove what are called the uh, acquired conceptions of inherent existence and afflictive obscurations from that. These mean, are the ones that we've acquired in this lifetime through the force of wrong tenets or you know, reifications of things just through our common usage and what have you. We have still to remove the innate ones. When we go back into a meditative equipoise and have the requisite, of merit, requisite amount of merit from that, we can then enter into the second ground. And when we have the path of release, I think it is, is when we enter into the um, uh, path of meditation. That's the fourth of these five paths. So we just had the path of seeing. It's relatively short compared to the path of meditation. The path of meditation encompasses the, the remaining grounds. And on the first six grounds, which would be after the path of seeing, you'd have the second through the seventh, you remove all the afflictive obscurations. On the last three, you removed these knowledge obscurations. And then you cross the threshold to what's called the path of no more learning. School's out, you know, once and for all. It's not just summer vacation, it's full vacation. <laughs> okay. So another way that I was going to mention that the knowledge obscurations are described, which is kind of useful for some people, is that if you had a clay pot that you stored garlic in, and I actually, we had this when I lived in San Francisco, we had a little clay pot, and you know that was just a nice place to throw the garlic cloves and what have you. Well, if you decide you want to use it for something else, you take all the garlic out, that's like removing the afflictive obscurations, but then you smell the pot and it's like, it's, it's, it's garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So, you know, you can't use it for something really, you know, yummy because it's all going to taste like garlic or something sweet. You know, that would be like really weird. I guess they do make garlic ice cream at the Gilroy Garlic Festival, though, so what do I know? Um, <laughs> so the stains, the imprints from having had the garlic in there is what we're smelling. It's like that's the, what the knowledge obscurations are like. They're the stains in our minds from having had the garlic, the, the conception of inherent existence. Okay, maybe we'll just take a, a little stand-up break just to get any blood circulating that needs to be circulated. Um, and because we've got about a half hour again, I meant to take a, a break a little bit earlier, just to a short stretch break. But if you do need to use the restroom, you're certainly welcome to do that. I'll just do like four or five minutes, perhaps mm -hmm. something like that. Okay, any um, additional questions on the third presentation result? It's got kind of a nice flow to it, these, these things. I mean, the, the, when you initially kind of put your head into it, you, at least my experience was <laughs> I couldn't figure out like the logic to all of it and how it was being put together. But I'm trying to present it in a very simple way because I think sometimes the texts get a little more complicated than what they need to be. But um, <laughs> let's, look at, let's look at function. This, this is the fourth presentation and Again, this is on your chart on page four of chart one uh, in the top right-hand corner there, the last column. It says, the topic of function presents by scriptural proof and reasoning that all sentient beings are capable of purifying their minds of adventitious stains and attaining nirvana. This is a tricky one because, yeah, I mean, you have to kind of get this logic, like I was saying in the meditation today about, you know, recognizing the emptiness of the mind allows us then to recognize the ability for us to remove all of that. And whether we're on the Hinayana path or the Mahayana path, it means that everything that is polluting our minds, whether they be afflictive obscurations or knowledge obscurations, aren't there naturally. They are there only adventitiously. So let's read the verse that pertains to this. The lineage has the function of bringing about aversion for the suffering of cyclic existence and the aspiration as well as the wish to attain the peace of nirvana. So we have kind of two main things that are being talked about here to some degree, but sometimes they're elaborated into three, and that's the case on the chart that you have. In the second column there, it says that the functions of the Tathagata essence or the lineage are threefold to generate the wish to abandon samsara, to generate the desire to attain nirvana, and to seek a method to accomplish that aim, which is kind of the outcropping of the first two. It, it's not explicitly in the verse. When we look at the verse, it just says the wish to attain peace and the aversion for samsara. So it kind of speaks to two things, and that's why some people only have two. But nonetheless, 
<laughs> the reasoning behind that is that if you do see an aver you develop an aversion for samsara and a desire to attain in nirvana, well then obviously it would logically follow that you seek some way to accomplish that aim. So how does it do that? Let's um, look at the verse 39 that speaks to that. If the basic Buddha element, this is another term for it, by the way, that I didn't have on my list of synonyms, Buddha element, Buddha nature. Wait, so which, wait, I, I'm lost. Which verse is the verse that's the fourth point? You said 34, but I thought I had that marked as third. 34 CD. Oh, the last two. Lines. Oh, I'm sorry, that should be changed. Oof. That's probably 38 CD. Oh, okay, because... Thank you for noticing that, Venerable Pommel. I, I, I'm... I don't have the perfection of PowerPoint yet. <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> so I'm sorry, those of you who yeah are online as well, um, verse 38 CD, I'm pretty sure. Is that right, Venerable Palma? Do you have the text in front of you? I just went back to change my verse 34. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I, I can check the text. I have it here and just make sure that this is where we're actually at. Here, here. Okay. Verse 38. In that way, independence on two methods? In that way, independence on two methods. In the C and D lines of 38. But here it says the lineage has the function. Maybe it is 34. Oh, I'm sorry, you do have to go back to 34. I was right. I do have the perfection of PowerPoint. <laughs> just joking, just joking. <laughs> um, okay, this is, this is, this, the third, the third point, it, it's overlapping. Verse 34 introduces the, the third and the fourth point. Two lines of 34. If we go back to the 34, sorry, I didn't like, I wasn't paying so much attention to the line numbers as we were going through this. So 34 AB, it was in, was the uh, presentation number three on, on result. And that's what's on the screen right now. Then when we get to the beginning of this one, I go back to verse 34 because the last two lines of verse 34 introduce the fourth presentation. So that's what happened. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I actually went back to the root text to kind of um, know the structure of it. But nonetheless, this is just a two-line introduction to this that we just did. So correct that, you know, wipe that. Whatever I was saying, you know, this is, this is the correct number, 34 CD. So now we have verse 39, because having done in the inter interim verses presentation number three, we're now going on to presentation number four. If the basic Buddha element did not exist, discouragement with the suffering of psychic existence would not occur, and the desire for nirvana, as well as seeking methods for attaining it and wishing for it, would also not exist. So again, there is this idea that if, the, if, if, we, if we didn't have this Buddha nature, that is the natural purity of the mind, again, together with this adventitious stains that need to be removed, this developmental lineage that is together with contaminations. If we didn't have the ability to kind of understand these concepts or get to these concepts, then these ideas wouldn't arise. We have to kind of be introduced to those concepts, at least, which are speaking to the nature of our Buddha lineage for us to be able to develop these states of mind in a more fully qualified way. Essentially, what we're talking about in this, this whole section, this fourth presentation, is the main function of helping us to develop renunciation. Renunciation, as I said, is common to those on the Hinayana path as well as the bodhisattvas. It's just that the bodhisattvas don't stop at renunciation. They don't say, okay, renunciation is good enough. I, it's going to get me the heck out of here. I'm exit out of samsara. Whereas the bodhisattvas say, I'm going to fully develop the mind of renunciation so that I can know my own suffering most deeply, so that I can then understand how other sentient beings are suffering and use that to feed my great compassion. Kabanka Rinpoche, in a commentary on the three principal aspects of the path, says that there is no difference between renunciation and compassion. I mean, it's just where you are directing it, and, great, and, and compassion in general. It's just where you are directing that compassion. Renunciation is compassion for yourself. You know, whereas compassion in the Mahayana is compassion for all beings. 
So, you know, compassion and renunciation are just, you know, one is a subset. The renunciation is simply a, the subset of self-compassion within the topic of compassion. But then there's also the great compassion of the bodhisattvas that goes beyond that. So this is essentially what this verse is about, is what is necessary for us to be able to uh, move in that direction is to have Buddha nature, Buddha lineage. So let me read, I wanted to read something here to elaborate on that a little bit. Let me go to my um, sheets here. I think it was in this book. And again, I don't know, it may not add that much to what I've already said, but nonetheless. Geshe Loden says, through contemplating the general and particular faults of samsara, one will come to associate the faults of, sam of suffering with samsara. Likewise, through contemplating the benefits of nirvana, one will come to associate the benefits of happiness with the attainment of nirvana. This occurs due to the presence of the Buddha potential, Buddha nature. If there were no Buddha potential, these associations would not be possible. When hearing of the faults of samsara and the benefits of nirvana, and when the mere sound of the teachings on emptiness causes tears to come to the eyes and the hairs of the body to stand on end, it is a sign of the awakening of the Buddha potential. You know, so we have kind of that, because our fundamental basis is this pure, clear light mind, because it is empty of inherent existence, because we have that Buddha lineage, it allows us to be a proper receptacle for developing renunciation, for developing a complete acknowledgement of the samsara, samsaric state that we and others are in, as well as the desire for all beings and ourselves to move towards nirvana. Again, from a Mahayana perspective, but I don't know if I can say more than that. You know, maybe for all of you it's self-evident or something, but to me it's still, there's, there's like a little disconnect yet, but nonetheless, I kind of get it because I think there does have to be Again, that is a basis for us to be able to open up to those ideas. And if you look at people who haven't been exposed to some idea that the mind can change, which is fundamentally what we are talking about in terms of developmental lineage, well then they will put their faith in something else or they will think that it's just a hopeless, such hopeless cause or they will you know, be discouraged in some way. It's because we know that we have that developmental lineage that is supported by our emptiness of the mind, the naturally abiding lineage, that we are then able to affect this process. And again, I went through the process a bit last night in terms of how we overcome uh, and attain a state of true cessation, but um, is that enough for folks, or do you kind of good enough, or do you have a question? <laughs> it's juicy. It really is kind of one of the, the nicer ones in some regard, because it does speak to this power that even though we might not have a deep awareness of it, it's what's underneath that ability to move in these directions, you know, towards what is more beneficial in nirvana and away from what is shown to be detrimental in samsara. The fifth presentation, possession. Uh, possession is spoken of in your chart, and that last column again is saying the topic of possession shows how causal qualities are possessed by the lineage and resultant qualities are possessed by the dharmakaya, which is the final transformation of lineage. So the causal qualities are here in this continuum up to that point where we cross that threshold. The resultant qualities are possessed on the other side of that threshold. In both cases, it is the suchness of the mind that possesses the respective compounded and uncompounded qualities in the manner of being one entity with them. As I said, we can't say you know, that um, great compassion is, is together with emptiness in terms of its nature because its nature is very different. It's a negation of inherent existence. Whereas we can still say that it's one entity because the mind that is empty of inherent existence that's with that emptiness has great compassion within it, right? So in that way, it's just spelling out that this is how we're talking about it, it does possess it. The suchness of the mind does possess those, but in a manner of not that it's somehow becoming a compounded phenomenon, rather that it's together with the compounded phenomenon of mind. Because form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Again, that idea that these are bound up in a single end entity, inextricably bound up. As long as a phenomenon exists, its emptiness exists. When it's emptiness, or when it goes out of existence, its emptiness is out of existence. And of course, its emptiness arises when it arises. Because we have mind which has no beginning or end, then we always have had the emptiness of the mind. And that emptiness here is possessing in the causal dimension certain qualities and in the resultant uh, dimension certain qualities.
All right. Let's read the verse for this that sets out the two. Um, um, Actually, this is the first one in terms of the cause. Just as a great ocean contains countless jewels and immeasurable water, so the basic element of a superior's qualities is the source of countless jewels of good qualities and the inexhaustible water of compassion, and thus it possesses the features of a cause. So again, a lot of parenthetical information that Jeffrey Hopkins has put in there. I don't know where these great oceans are that contain countless jewels. <laughs> I've never, <laughs> I've never swam in one, but, <laughs> but I guess this is more of a mythology too. This idea of you know all these jewels that are within this great body of water. Um, so this is kind of saying that you know the basic element of a superior's qualities. Again, we are talking here about a superior being that is prior to attaining enlightenment. By superior or arya, we mean someone who has directly realized emptiness. They are the source of countless jewels of good qualities and the inexhaustible water of compassion. So it possesses these qualities or features of being uh, kind of a cause for the result that we're going to talk about shortly. Then let's look at the, the result. Because of being an entity endowed with the indivisible qualities of clairvoyance, uncontaminated exalted wisdom, and uncontaminated abandonment, it possesses the features of an effect, like an oil lamps having the indivisible qualities of illumination, warmth, and color. So the analogy that's used here for the, uh, uh, again, this is speaking to the emptiness of the mind after enlightenment, which is the nature truth body, kind of being possessing these features by virtue of the mind of the Buddha, the wisdom truth body, having those within it. And they're kind of seen to be like an oil lamp having these indivisible qualities of illumination. This is what, you know, it illuminates things. It's warm because it's a fire and fire always comes together with heat. And then you have color, which is kind of the, the color of the flame that is arising. So within the flame uh, from the oil lamp, you have these indivisible qualities that we can isolate mentally, but they're all part of that experience of the flame of an oil lamp. So... These are essentially what I just said. These are two. There are two illustrations. This is also on your chart pertaining to the possession of the qualities of the causes and of the result. The qualities of the purifying causes of the lineage possessed by the lineage are likened to the great ocean, and the qualities of the result of the transformation of lineage possessed by the result in Dharmakaya are likened to a lamp. So again, we're talking about it prior to enlightenment in the mind of an of an Arya superior being, and then post-enlightenment in the mind of a Buddha, the uh, yana, yana Dharmakaya, the wisdom truth body of a Buddha. Let's read the verse that um, speaks to that in more detail. Because of containing the basic element or cause of the truth body, devotion to the great vehicle, of attaining a conqueror's exalted wisdom, deep wisdom, and of the operation of great compassion, this basic constituent is shown to be similar to an ocean through correspondence with a vessel having jewels and having water. So the great ocean has all three of these. It is a vessel, a receptacle of all of that water, a really big one if you're talking about like the Pacific Ocean, right? And it has jewels, again, this water that has somehow all these wonderful magical jewels floating in it. <laughs> And then having water itself, because it's, again, the receptacle, the jewels, and the water. These three are compared to the, uh, again, the basic element itself, which is the cause of the truth body, which is the vessel that all this is held within. And then you have the exalted wisdom that are like the jewels within the great compassion, which is the water. Again, just one way of talking about this and giving some flavor for the possession of these various qualities that occur. So the illustrations of how the qualities that are purifying causes of the lineage are possessed by lineage, because you may recognize that some of these that were in there, you saw, right, that he had uh, devotion to the great vehicle in there. Remember hearing that not that long ago, earlier today? Uh, great compassion in there, deep wisdom. So we're going to correlate those four causes that we talked about in terms of the qualities that they induce within a practitioner that's on the Mahayana path. First, faith in the Mahayana is the cause of the Dharmakaya and is like the repository, the receptacle. 
everything is held within the faith in the Mahayana. This is what allows us to kind of move forward and continue this progress of developing our Buddha lineage. Uh, the uncommon Mahayana wisdom, which is the exalted wisdom of a bodhisattva, the perfection of wisdom, and the samadhi, or meditative stabilization, uh, which is, again, the perfection of concentration that is practiced by the bodhisattva, those two states of mind, which were the second and third of our four causes, achieve the exalted wisdom of a Buddha and are the jewels that are held in the ocean. And the great compassion, you know, which we saw as the fourth cause, is, uh, flows into the great compassion of the Tathagata and is likened to water. And you know, what we are developing every time we turn our minds towards great compassion is eventually the great compassion of a Buddha. You know, which we don't have perfected yet, obviously, but is everyone clear then on the ca on the causal side, everything that happens prior to enlightenment? Again, because mostly what we are talking about in terms of that second one being pointed at as an Arya being is when it has developed at least to that point where the Arya being has, of course, realized emptiness as it is. Prior to that, on the path of preparation and the path of accumulation, you are only realizing it conceptually. You're only realizing it through this generic image, this meaning generality, kind of having an idea of what emptiness is, which is actually how the conceptual mind knows everything. It only knows them in terms of an idea of what they are. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about um, the, the, color, the color teal right now, bring teal to your mind. You know, you've, we've all seen teal and have an, a meaning generality of teal, but are you seeing teal? I don't know if there's teal in the room. Is anyone wearing teal? Iona's wearing a little bit of kind of teal. I don't know, is that shirt teal? Would you consider yeah, it teal? <laughs> teal? Teal is maybe a, yeah. a, little a, little brighter, a little brighter, a little brighter, perhaps. It's a little greener. Yeah. yeah. It's blue-green. Yeah. Green. Green. Okay. Anyway, so, so if you are seeing teal, if the color teal is appearing to your eye consciousness, then you're uh, seeing it directly without any medium between. But if you are thinking of teal with your conceptual mind, then you're always having a meaning generality. Mm -hmm. It's the same with emptiness. We can't really be free of that till we enter the path of seeing, become a superior being, because at that point we have seen emptiness directly, not through our eyes, but known emptiness directly through our mental consciousness. You've developed what's called a direct yogic realization of emptiness. Anyway, so that was on the causal side, because Arya beings can still be on the causal side because they haven't yet become fully enlightened, uh, perhaps. Uh, again, we use the term Arya Buddha, sometimes refer to a Buddha. It's just a way of referring to them. It doesn't mean that they're only an Arya. Yes. Don, why did you just say perhaps for Arya beings? Because again, as what I just said, that we could still call the Buddha an Arya Buddha, oh. and there's no fault because oh. they they have a superior mind. Yes. Okay. It's just they also have an even more superior mind than those who are just Aryas and not yet Buddhas. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the resultant side in terms of possession, this um, fifth of these uh, ten presentations. Because the five clairvoyances, uncontaminated, exalted wisdom, the undefiled suchness, and the abandonments of thorough transformation subsist indivisibly in the undefiled basis, it corresponds to an oil lamp in which illumination, warmth, and color subsist indivisibly. So, this gets a little, I've got a lot of terminology in here. You first are introduced to these first five clairvoyances. There are said to be six clairvoyances, and one of them is unique to a Buddha because it is a clairvoyance that is in the next one, knowing the extinction of contaminations, which would of course be only in the mind of a Buddha because you have uh, the ability then to know that all the extinctions have been contaminated within one's own mind. But the first five, which are those of miraculous emanation, the divine ear, knowing others' minds, knowing previous lives, knowing birth and death. Uh, sometimes uh, one of these that says, uh, the last one, I think, knowing birth and death, sometimes this is replaced with the divine eye. I'm not sure the difference in these presentations of... Uh, but this is what's on our chart, nonetheless, is these five. Um, these can be there in a lesser form with those who have attained any of the concentrations, what are called the four yanas or, or concentrations, uh, these four kind of states of mind that are based on very deep concentration that are beyond calm abiding. These jhanas are essentially developed by going into a process of 
kind of seeking the peace of a higher level. So from the state of calm abiding, you seek the peace of the first concentration, seeing the calm abiding as course. Once you attain the first concentration, you can go on to attain the second by seeing the second as more peaceful and the first as course and continue up the ladder. But even when you get to the first concentration, you have attained these clairvoyances in this lesser form. Here we're talking about them being qualities of the resultant dharmakaya, though, so we're not talking about them as ordinary clairvoyances. I find it strange that they even talk about clairvoyance because a Buddha knows all phenomena, so it, you don't have to talk about needing a special seeing of something, a, you know, a clear seeing that what is a clairvoyance, literally, because the Buddha is clearly seeing all phenomena at all times. But nonetheless, these are likened to the illumination of a lamp because they destroy the darkness that prevents it. So that prevents experience of all phenomena. That I do have to correct. So I don't have the perfection of PowerPoint yet. So <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> Anyway, this is, this is um, again, the illumination, the clear seeing, that is the clairvoyance that allows us to know all of these phenomena. The Dharmakaya is absolutely possessed by that, right? You know, possesses that, not possessed by that, possesses that. It's got that absolute knowledge. The clairvoyance knowing the extinction of contaminations is likened to the heat of that flame of the oil lamp. Why? Because it has uh, burnt away the firewood of karma and the afflictions. So it has completely consumed all of the contaminations and therefore can be manifest. That's the sixth clairvoyance that is often set out and again is unique to Buddhas. The extinction of contaminations itself is likened to the color of the flame because it is clear light, undefiled and pure. So the flame kind of has that complete, you know, purity. It doesn't have anything with it, within it that's polluting it. The flame itself just has its essence as a flame, which is essentially that pure kind of color we can see through a flame to some degree, I suppose. But anyway, it's clear light, undefiled and pure. Parts of it, at least, yeah. The part closer to the wick, I think, would have be harder to see. So go back to the verse. We saw again that the wording was different in Jeffrey Hopkins' translation, but it's nonetheless... The five clairvoyances are like the illumination. The exalted wisdom itself is like the heat. Um, uh, that is the clairvoyance, I'm sorry, the clairvoyance, knowing the contaminations that are you know, removed are like the heat. And then the abandonments of thorough transformation uh, that is the actual extinction of the contaminations is like the, the flame. So let's go to, let me see, do I wanna say anything more on that? Look at my notes. Again, you can study these clairvoyances in certain texts. I studied them in the master's program in the text by Maitreya that I mentioned earlier. Do people enjoy that part? You, know, you guys are studying real hard, and all of a sudden you're reading about the results. And yeah. it's, it's so inspiring. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the text, um, Maitreya's ornament, is set up in terms of eight topics. And the very first one is the exalted knower of all aspects, the Buddha's mind. And so you go into all these various things that kind of are causes for that and everything. It's, it's, it's a much more elaborate text expounding upon all of this, but nonetheless, it touches right from the beginning on that and then goes into other knowers at the Buddha that we can talk about in terms of the path and so on, and then goes into the whole process by which the result in truth body arises. So it kind of starts with Buddha mind and ends with yeah, you know that good, result. It's so it's it's kind of it's nice. It's a really good text to study. Yeah. Um, and even if you study chapter four of ornament, which is in the ma the basic program, you gain appreciation for what is set out. It's only the the one chapter that goes into the aspects of that exalted knower, meaning what is known by that exalted knower, the, you know, the objects of that mind. So let me talk about manifestation. We're getting close to lunch, but I, it's a very quick topic because, as I said earlier, the rest of the presentations are a continuation of the sixth topic, just going into it. What we're talking about here is kind of the way that we could say that there is a difference in lineage to some degree even though the suchness is constant throughout these stages, we can say it is different on the basis of what it is being posited in relation to. So the emptiness of a mind that's still together with all the contaminants versus an emptiness of a mind that's together with a partial removal of the contaminants versus the emptiness of a mind that's together with the complete removal of the contaminants. So let's go ahead and look at this, and if we need to review it when we come back after lunch, we can do that. The topic of manifestation, this too is again on your chart, 
shows that Buddha nature exists in all sentient beings and that the stains do not abide in the nature of the mind by showing that, although by nature it is the same in all beings, there are different bases for posi positing it as follows, different times that we can look at in the continuum of a being. The suchness of an ordinary being, you know, which, <laughs> raise my hand, the suchness of a learner superior are the naturally abiding lineage. You know, a learner superior even still has a naturally abiding lineage, you know, that is in, in this way of not having removed uh, all of the contaminants. So it's in the second category. Whereas the suchness of a Buddha superior is the nature truth body that is a complete purity of natural stain. So you have three points on the continuum that are just three examples. One is an ordinary being that hasn't begun the process at all. A learner superior, meaning a someone who is on the learning path but has is an Arya only, hasn't yet become an Arhat, um, again, or uh, a fully enlightened being. I mean, there is somebody who is on the still on their respective path. Those are both naturally abiding lineage, right? They're before crossing that threshold and becoming a Buddha. And then the third one is somebody who has crossed that threshold. It's the suchness of a Buddha superior, the suchness of their mind, is the nature truth body that is a complete purity of natural stains. Therefore, there's a suchness of a mind from which no stains have been removed, a suchness of a mind from which the stains have been partially removed, and a suchness of the mind from which the stains have been completely removed. And what I've been saying earlier. So, Verse 44, stemming from the manifestation of difference and suchness in common beings, learners superiors, and perfect Buddhas, the perceiver of suchness, the Buddha taught fortunate sentient beings about this essence of the conquerors. So the Buddha, who's called here the perceiver of suchness, taught you know sentient beings about this essence because there's, there's a difference in suchness simply by virtue of the basis for that suchness. The suchness itself is undifferentiated. <laughs> you know, the emptiness of the mind is always a constant and always unchanging and has again existed forever and will exist forever as the naturally abiding lineage prior to enlightenment as the nature truth body after enlightenment. But nonetheless, this is just speaking to the, this different manifestations. Let's read the next verse. Common beings err with respect to the true mode of subsistence. Superiors, seeing the truth, are the opposite. Ones gone thus perceive how things are without error. And having overcome the predispositions of the two obstructions are without fictional elaboration. So you've got three different bases. Again, the being who has a mind that is still, you know, still just together with uh, holding on to some true mode of subsistence. They're erring with regard to that. They're just continuing to be caught up in their own ignorance. The superiors that are seeing the truth, they have realized emptiness directly and thereby have the ability to remove at least a portion of the obstructions. And then those who are Buddhas, one's gone thus, which is literally the translation of Tathagata, mm -hmm. that they perceive how things are without error. They're never without the wisdom realizing emptiness. And having you know, overcome all those predispositions are without any fictional elaboration. They would never have ignorance present in their mind and elaborate things in a way that is contrary to how they exist. So the three bases in which suchness is located are ordinary beings. In this case, we're using Arya Bodhisattvas, but we could say it also could be, as an example, any other Arya being that has not yet attained you know, um, the state of Buddhahood. But again, we're in the Mahayana path, so we're mostly going to refer to Arya Bodhisattvas and Arya Buddhas. So the three types of suchness that are located in the bases are suchness within the non-purification of stains, suchness within the partial purification, suchness within the complete purification. That's it. <laughs> That's manifestation. I mean, it's fairly easy, that one, once we've gone through the other ones and understood what's going on here, you know, that we're just simply talking about different bases. Now, as I said this afternoon when we start... I think we've got time to go through all four of these and talk about how it's further divided into states, pervasiveness, immutability, and divisibility, because we're going to keep using this template of these three beings, three different states, you know, of the common being, ordinary being, the, the Arya Bodhisattva, or someone who has at least, you know, removed some portion of the stains, and then the person who has completely removed them all, the Arya Buddha, the, those who are, you know, in that state. Okay, a lot of words. <laughs> Any final questions before we disperse for lunch? 
Okay. Yes, Kim. So for the uh, Hinayana path, uh -huh. um, they could achieve also the area Buddhas, but maybe at a different level of area Buddhas? Well, they will attain the state of Buddhahood only after they've entered the Mahayana path, you know, so they do have to still become a bodhisattva. Those on the Hinayana path, they could do it at any point. I mean, if they're on the learning path, they're still t moving towards their goal of arhat. They could move out into the Hinayana path at any point in there if they are through the blessings of the Buddha and their own karma, somehow that's awoken in them, their Buddha, what we call the Bodhisattva lineage, that Mahayana lineage, that is something that is unique to those who have a predisposition to that right from the beginning. But nonetheless, it can be awoken in anyone at any particular time. Some of them actually complete their path and they become an arhat and they say what happens to them is when they die on the basis of the body in which they achieve that state, their mind continues on in what's called a mental body that essentially is, uh, I think the way that the Chittamatrans describe it, which I think is in accord with the Madhy Madhyamaka point of view, is that they're actually born in, in some sort of like a lotus in, a, in some field or something, and they are eventually stirred out of that by a Buddha. When I don't know what determines that, but at some point, after having been in solitary peace, they are moved to kind of go do the additional work. They essentially say, hate to tell you this, but you know, this isn't your final result. You know, you've checked out a samsara and you're kind of hanging out in this wonderful place, but you still have work to do. There's more work to be done, which must be really disappointing, but <laughs> um, so, so they take those beings and guide them gradually into the Mahayana. And of course they don't have to get a, all the wisdom side is done. They've removed all the afflictive obstructions. What they have to do is go through the Mahayana path to accumulate all the merit through having cultivated bodhicitta and engaged in the other perfections. And then eventually they still do have to recultivate that wisdom realizing emptiness to remove the final obstructions to knowledge or to omniscience, you know, those that I mentioned earlier. So yes, I mean, they become Arya Buddhas eventually but they don't become Arya Buddhas until they become Arya Bodhisattvas, until they actually enter the Mahayana path. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So let's take our lunch break. Again, we'll reconvene at 2. Let's just have a dedication prayer, and then we'll go through the plans for lunch. Uh, let's go to the prayer book and just go to the Sok tab, which is, you'll see it in, in all your prayer books. There's a should be one. If there isn't, then you're going about, what, three three pages from the back. Mm -hmm. There's um, three sets of pages from the back where it, uh, on the page facing you, it'll say dedication, prayers, after soak. We're just going to do the first two there. Uh, let's do them in English. Maybe we'll do them in Tibetan at the end of today. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so enjoy your lunch. <laughs>